Hello, thank you for joining us today. Entrepreneurs in Christ consists of a tribe of marketplace ministers doing business with godly values and with an emphasis on marketplace ministry. We are confident you did not stumble upon this page by chance, but we believe God divinely orchestrated this moment and you were handpicked to hear this message. We implore you to sit back and feed your spirit with the undiluted word of God, which is able to build you up as an effective kingdom entrepreneur and marketplace minister. We ask that you subscribe to this page as we release fresh content that will confirm your faith and convictions to maintain a righteous stand with God on a weekly basis. Also, please do like this video, click on the like button, share with a friend, share with a family member and leave a comment or question below where necessary. Thank you and God bless you. Bye. Holy Spirit, I welcome your presence. Grant our trans, speak to your people. Words that are spirit and life in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Victoria, give me scriptures. I want to move fast. John 1 verse 14. Guys, in this anniversary, I want to thank every single person who made it possible, who made it a success. The Lord himself be your reward. I have planned to teach in Kenya because in Nigeria we plan for us to have guest ministers. Prophet Jesse Jangfa, Apostle Tena Yahemba. In Accra, Ghana, we had Reverend Isaac Odame, and they, they gave us phenomenal truths. And they were able to release certain impartations and graces that we needed at entrepreneurs in Christ. Um, unfortunately, our trip to Kenya was truncated. We were not able to get to Kenya. And because we were not able to get to Kenya, I was not able to teach. So I came back and the Spirit of God said, well, can you just teach a bit of what you wanted to teach? And I said, sure, let's see what we can get done. So grace for supernatural works happens to be our theme for this year, 2023. God gave us this theme in the place of much prayer and supplication. We waited on God for the renewal of our strength. And the Spirit of God did not disappoint us. I heard it very clearly, grace for supernatural works. I want to take time to explain this theme and I want you to understand why we are doing what we are doing at Entrepreneurs in Christ. If you're following us and if you've been with us for quite a while now, you will see that we've taken time to analyze some very critical graces in the body of Christ every single month right from January, when we look into the topic of grace. Then we began to look into other topics in the different aspects of graces that complete a soldier in God's kingdom. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole world. And I want you to pay attention as I explain this topic. You see, Impartations is not just when a person begins to lay his hands on your head. By the Spirit of God, impartations happen with us talking and teaching. That's a grace He gave us as entrepreneurs in Christ. Someone gave us a heartwarming testimony yesterday. They joined entrepreneurs in Christ. And they began to listen to our messages and join our meetings. And the grace to live a pure life was imparted. They stopped drinking, they stopped smoking, they stopped womanizing. We never for once laid hands on the person. I've never even met the person before. That is what God can do. So graces can be imparted. If the person carries those graces, it can be imparted just by you listening. It depends on how open your heart is. If your heart is open, the Spirit of God can come into your heart and work 
what he wants to do. So grace for supernatural works. <clears throat> the Bible says, And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The word became flesh. Now, I don't have time to open the beginning of this scripture where the Bible says that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. As a young boy, that scripture confused me a great deal. I tried to rationalize God by looking at that statement with two objects. Perhaps I take two bottles of water and I say, okay, this one is the word. The other bottle is God, a bigger bottle, of course. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word, okay, so the bottle of water existed. The word was with God, okay, so it was with a bigger bottle of water. But now you are telling me that the word was God. Confused me a great deal. Scriptures are enclosed until you have access in the spirit. There are many things you would never know until you have access. See, sometimes people send me testimonies that warm my heart. Because when God calls a people or a person, there are graces he puts in them to do the work. So somebody began to receive the gift of revelation in my prophetic team. And the person will send it to me and I'll be so happy because I carry that grace. I carry that grace. Revelation knowledge is a grace that God gives. And depending on how much you've drank from that stream, you can be let in. So when that guy said what he said about being living a pure life, I was so greatly encouraged because that is what my dealing has been with God. By His grace, we live a life of purity. I live a life of purity. So I'm not surprised when someone says that that grace has come on them. So I want you to open your heart. Because God wants to impart a few graces. <clears throat> the Bible says the word, this word that became or that was with God and the word that was God that word became flesh and that word dwelt among us it dwelt amongst us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth oh my I can I can break this scripture down into five sentences. The first part says, and the word was made flesh. The second one says, the word dwelt amongst us. The third one said, we beheld the glory of the word. We beheld the glory. Perhaps you've been reading the Bible every single day. You don't know that there is a glory you can behold from that scripture you are reading. I'm telling you that there is. This man says we beheld the glory of the word. Number four says the glory as of the only begotten son of the father. The only begotten of the father, which is the only begotten son of the father. Sentence number five says it was full of grace and truth. Guys, I don't want to lose you, so please pay attention because I'm going to try to explain a few things and my teaching style is that I will teach as the spirit leads we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace full of truth what was his glory full of when they saw him the Bible says that there were two things. 
that glory was full of grace that glory was full of truth the physical Jesus when they beheld him with their eyes the grace on his life was evident you can't carry a grace and we don't know that you have a grace it will be evident in your life it's as simple as a beautiful woman you see her you know she's beautiful it's not hard grace makes all the difference you know i used to hear apostle selman say something he said if it's there it's there if it's not there it's not there it is true that man wasn't lying if you have it you have it in this kingdom you can behold grace you can see it you can touch it for instance the teaching grace in my life is quite interesting it's a grace it comes on you i may begin to step into a meeting and i don't plan to see anything in that meeting if i open my mouth the grace will start speaking you can behold it but i want to point your attention to something that is true the bible says that when they saw him he was full of grace and he was full of truth my friends there are many formulas to the word glory and i've thought quite a bit about it god began to pull me deeper and teach me about the glory and i'm still learning but from what i have learned so far i've learned quite a great deal but in this scripture we are given a very simple formula for glory and i want you to take note of it the formula for glory is therefore grace plus truth he says he was full of grace and he was full of truth they saw his glory the glory of as of the only begotten of the father when they analyzed that glory they saw grace on one side they saw truth on the other side my friends hear me well hear me well because we can't be ignorant as christians whenever a person applies the right balance of grace with truth there will always be a corresponding glory that will emerge this is true that's why this topic is so important Christians are devoid of glory everywhere around the world. We watch the devil make a mockery of our lives. As though our God does not exist. There is something we are missing. How Jesus did it is how you would do it. The Bible says his glory was full of grace and truth. The formula for glory the formula if you want to experience glory it is grace plus truth and so when you begin to apply the right balance of grace and you balance it with truth a corresponding glory will emerge out of your life that's what we are all yearning for either consciously or unconsciously consciously or subconsciously let me let me give you some true facts some true statements <laughs> you see there are three major events in a person's life three major events two of them are guaranteed one It's supposed to happen but we'll see the first major event is the day a person was born it's an event the second major event in a person's life is the day they get married the third major event in your life is the day you die 
Nobody can take these three things away from you. Major events. But out of those three, they are only very active for one event. Most people. As a baby, you don't have any control of what happens around you on the day you were born. The same thing applies on the day you die. There's nothing that you control. But you control the day of your marriage. Now, all three events, believe it or not, are a display of glory. When a person is born, it's a glorious event. I watched my wife birth two kids. The joy that comes into the world when a baby emerges. Oh my. When a person dies, it's sad, but it's that it is called a transition into glory. That too is an event of glory. And of course, the day a person gets married, can you think of a more joyous occasion? These are all events of glory. And we can all agree that the wedding day is a day of glory, especially for the bride who has waited all her life for such a special moment. Now, I want us to take that event and dissect it. What birthed that glory? The one that we see when the bride walks in as a stunning bride and everybody stands on their feet to welcome the bride. Or when they are dancing into their reception and they look glorious. What led to that moment in time? You see, it was grace that made them cross each other's paths. Grace, pure grace. And you can hear all kinds of wedding stories, how they met. For instance, my wife and I were Facebook friends before we met in real life. I was eyeing her on Facebook before I met her. That's grace. Grace made our paths cross. But there were truths that were applied. That couple would date each other. They will have courtship. And that courtship, they would see if they were a good fit for each other in almost all ramifications. And when they agree that they are a good fit, then the man will propose first truth before she says yes, another truth. And then they find themselves on the altar. This is the right balance, my friends. You are looking for glory. There is a balance, there's an equation for it. The Bible says grace and truth. That's what his glory was made of. It's no different in the world. Perhaps you want to look at the glory that comes from the baby. The same thing applies, grace and truth. You may have intimacy with your wife. You have no control of the baby being put in the womb. You have no control of it. You have no control of the birth process coming out through nine months successfully. No control. But the truth is that you did your part. A man and woman came together. So truth was applied with grace. It's breathed a corresponding glory. The Bible says the word became flesh. That word dwelt amongst us. We beheld his glory. It was the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And that glory was full of grace and truth. That's the right balance. When grace is balanced with truth, a corresponding glory is issued from the realm of God. It's a spiritual law. Don't look too far. If there's no glory in your life, you've either left out grace or you've left out truth. That's it. 
The day of birth is beautiful. I think that day should be most celebrated beyond any birthday. But the celebrant himself is not conscious or aware of his environment. The Bible says, do you know how the bones of a child forms in its mother's womb? That is pure grace, my friends. So glory in our realm is fairly predictable. In God's realm, glory is defined as his sovereign nature and his sovereign character. That's glory. His nature and his character. The Apostle John said we beheld that glory. See, there are spiritual things that can be tangible in the world of men. Mm -hmm. Spiritual things. It can be tangible. And even though they are spiritual, they can be felt and be held. The writer of this book that we're looking at now is John. John was the brother of James, sons of Zebedee. Give me John 21 verse 24. John 21 verse 24. Look at what he says. This is the disciple who testifies of these things. This is the disciple who wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. An eyewitness account written by the disciple whom Jesus loved. So, he saw the glory. We can take it from him. Now that you, you have an idea of what glory consists of, can I see us type it in the comments? Put it in the comments, put it in the chat. From what I've said, if you are looking for glory, how do we find it? Can I see you guys put it in the comments? You see, I'm a teacher, and if if I had my way, I'd have had us on mute and and say it out loud. However, it will waste our time. What is glory consistent of? From what I've said. Yes, ma'am. Grace plus truth. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to see that. We're following. That's the formula for glory. You want glory in any area of your life. Balance, grace, and truth. That is it. That's it. Folks, that truth stands for works. It stands for works. And I will explain. You see, work is something that you exert energy to do. Right now, it can be said that I am working. I'm working. I'm exerting a kind of energy. It's called spiritual energy. I'm working. So anytime work comes to mind, there is a truth being revealed. Keep that in mind. You are exerting energy to do something. That's work. But if there is a supply of grace, that grace makes it such that it is easier to do the work. That's the difference. So everybody here has work to do. Everybody. You're either an entrepreneur or you have a regular nine to five job or something like that. You have work to do. And that work is non-negotiable. You have to do that to survive. But if you want that work to come out flawlessly, if you want that work to brought a corresponding glory, grace must balance it. And each time there is supply of grace, work becomes 
easier. Now, don't forget this statement. Wherever focus goes, energy flows. Anything you are focused on, energy will move in that direction. Any kind of energy, be it spiritual, be it kinetic, whatever kind of energy you can think of. Any kind of energy will flow. Or going somewhere, follow me. Grace is the energy God provides to do the work of marketplace ministry and the work of his kingdom. You must not forget what I'm telling you today. If you begin to do marketplace ministry and there is no grace, there is no grace on your life, you will see that it is not easy to do what we are doing. It's purely a work of grace. God supplies grace for the work. It comes from him. The work is our own part. We must do it. For instance, the grace of a teacher can give me revelational ideas. It comes often, almost every day. And as I begin to receive revelation, I still have a work to do to teach. I have to open my mouth. God won't do that for me. He won't. So I have to come and do the work. But because he has supplied grace, it will now look to you like, oh, this guy finds it easy to teach. No, the secret is grace. But there is still work to do. So the work of marketplace ministry and the work of God's kingdom is always balanced with grace. And grace is the energy God gives, the energy God provides to do the work that he has given you. Let me tell you a, a truth. God is preoccupied with making his kingdom come here upon the face of the earth. That is his major preoccupation. Don't think too far. Perhaps you're wondering if God is busy creating. He's already created. He made you and I. He just wants to make his kingdom come. Give me Matthew 6.13. Now we're beginning to build a foundation and then I will explain a few things and then we are done. Hmm. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Power is defined as the ability to do work. Put it on the chat, Allah. That's the simple definition of power. And this scripture seems to be saying God is the one that has the power. He has that power within. In other words, he is the one that supplies the power. If God's glorious kingdom will be revealed on the face of the earth, it will take men who have been empowered by heaven to do it. It's really real. You can't move in the flesh and do it. If you, you know, they, they interviewed a guy in an African country a couple of years ago or so. He, he won the lottery. He was a pastor, he won the lottery. And when he won the lottery, he shut down his church. He had no call in the first place. In our countries, people based on poverty go into creating churches and all kinds of ministries. They do that in Nigeria. The man has no call, but government has no work for him. He can't find work in the private sector. Then he starts thinking of God's kingdom as if he cares. <clears throat> But I'm telling you that if God's kingdom will be revealed, it will take men who have been empowered by heaven to do it. To take men. There will be a grace that will be so flawless on their lives. You will not be able to dispute that grace. You will know, This one has been empowered by God to do what he's doing. You will know. 
there will be a clear difference. The seven up, the difference is clear. <laughs> the difference will be very clear. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4.20, the kingdom of God is not in words, it is in power. Keep that in mind. So manifesting the kingdom comes with power. And when this kingdom is revealed, because you and I are working, I'm telling you that there is a corresponding glory that comes with it. There will be a glory that will come. Okay. Give me Habakkuk 2.14. Habakkuk 2, 14. Follow me, we're building a, a foundation. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's a metaphor. Now, my friends, the way God supplies us with power to do this work of revealing his kingdom, okay, because he wants that glorious kingdom to be revealed, he gives us something called grace. You can't do it without grace. So, I think I have given us a bit of a foundation for this teaching. <clears throat> I have a question for us. What does God give a fully committed and serious man or woman who reveals a dimension of his kingdom upon the earth? What's the benefit? Why should I do it? Why should I partner with God? Now, give me Matthew 19, 27. Matthew 19, 27. The Bible says, Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? We have left all. We have followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? This is a very, very frank question he's asking Jesus. And Jesus could have asked him, yeah, a boat and some fish. Is that all what you call all? <laughs> he's saying that they have left their boat. They have left their fishing business. They have left their family. They have left their friends. They have left their livelihood. They have left their normalcy. Many of us on here will begin to leave relationships. I see it in the spirit already. What God is doing in your life before he can reveal you as a marketplace minister is that he's trying to get you to leave all and follow him. That's a word for someone. So Peter asks the question, we have left all we have followed you. What shall we have? See, my friends, if you haven't learned to ask that question, you've not started losing. That's the problem. There is a point in your journey with God where you would have left all, everything that you know to be normal to you as a man, you would have left it all. 
at that point there's a tipping point right there at that point i'm telling you that something in you will ask the question peter asked and if you have not asked that question it is an indication that you have not left all it's normal imagine i tell moses i'm seeing his picture smiling at me and i say moses leave your business leave your family leave everything you are doing all i want you to do now is to follow me up and down the whole place so moses begins that journey he leaves and he thinks this is cool i like damola let's do this and we continue we go for three months we are jumping from city to city and i give him what i can give him when i give it to him an allowance for lack of better words he's left his wife he's left his kids he's left his house he's left his business he left his car and he's following me at some point he would stop and say damola i've left all to follow you what am i going to have i'm just showing you how you can gauge your walk with the spirit of god and if you have not gotten there you have not listen if you have not asked that question you have not left all you haven't you haven't what does all mean to a child of god now let's look at jesus response in verse 28 jesus said to them assuredly i say to you that in the regeneration when the son of man sits on the throne of his glory we're well, back to the story of glory it's still glory when he sits on the throne of his glory you who have followed me you will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake that person shall receive a hundredfold that person shall re- inherit eternal life there are two things jesus promised people that live all please i want you to pay attention And everything he said here summarized or summarizes our lives. Houses, real estate, brothers, sisters, father, mother. In that category, there is family, there's friendships covered in there. Relationships, wife, children, lands. For my namesake. If this is you, like I was using Moses to give the example. If you have found yourself in that situation, that same guarantee made here to the disciples is being made to us. If you've left all of these things for my name's sake, you will receive a hundredfold, number one. Number two, you will inherit eternal life. And I want you to look at this because I'm trying to explain to you what it means to be grace for supernatural works. Mm. Mm. A hundredfold of what they had, they will inherit eternal life. Question What is eternal life? Let's start there. And, you know, I used to think that eternal life simply means to live forever. Such that when life ends here, that life continues somewhere else. That's simple enough for us to understand. And for a long time, I thought like that. So God began to reveal a few things to me. Give me John 17 verse 3. Let's know what eternal life is. Don't forget hold on hold on before we even go there don't forget the question this question came from the promise given to those who are called into marketplace ministry those who are called into pulpit ministry 
because ministry as soon as we put that word there it indicates the supernatural you can pass life from your vessel so grace for supernatural works that's where supernatural comes in you've left all to follow him and jesus gives us two guarantees both of these two guarantees should bring us to the point of glory but i want you to understand these two guarantees and i'm going to start with inheriting eternal life now i ask the question what does eternal life consist of what is it now give me that scripture john 7 john um john 17 verse 3 jesus described eternal life for us there this is eternal life that they may know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent sounds disappointing huh you thought eternal life was mansions in heaven and you know the fancier things in life it's given to us here this is eternal life that they may know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent <clears throat> so what christ is saying to us here the person will inherit the knowledge of the father the only true god and the knowledge of the son Follow me, we're going somewhere. That's eternal life. The knowledge of the Father, the knowledge of the Son. Now, give me 1 John 5, from verse 4 to 11 to 14. 1 John 5. Now, give me verse... Um, where do we start from? Verse 4 okay let me explain about eternal life because it may not just be what you think it is there are two dimensions to eternal life eternal life is quantitative and that means that it doesn't end okay it's life forever so that when you leave this realm you can continue in the next realm but it is also qualitative and i'm trying to move as fast as we can keep to time or i'll show you some more scriptures it is qualitative it's the highest quality of life on earth the highest on earth for instance from eternal life we can derive peace that passes human understanding those in the world don't have that peace they don't have it in eternal life there's a resource for divine health there's a resource for divine healing it has this major qualities i can go on and on when you look at the word used for eternal life in that scripture it is transliterated from the greek word ionos ionos a-i-o-n-o-i-s that word means life of the age to come so what is happening here is that there is a life in an age to come that life or that age to come rather is the new heaven the new earth that you read about in revelations so what is happening is that jesus brought us eternal life from that realm he brought us life from that realm we can live as citizens of that realm here in this realm that's what eternal life truly means we're going somewhere follow me please he brought an economy from the world to come he brought it into this realm and you can access it through knowledge is what he's saying the knowledge of the father the knowledge of the son in the world to come nobody falls sick 
It's a sickless life. In the world to come, you don't need security guards in your house. The glory of God is in our midst. God is the is the Shekinah, the illumination of that place. In the world to come, you can't be in debt. You can't fail. There is not even any um, tempter per se to come and do certain things to your life because you'll be bound for a thousand years. You can you can touch that economy in this realm, is what God is saying. So eternal life means all of these things to you and I. Now look at First John five verse four. He says, "Whatever is born of God overcomes the world." And this is the victory that has overcome the world. He calls it our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. <clears throat> who is he that overcomes the world? If you want to overcome this world, and leave the resource of eternal life in this world there's a task that you have to do your faith should believe that jesus is the son of god please follow me we're going somewhere i'm just giving you context and prayer is an act of faith so through prayer we can draw from the life of the age to come we can fetch it into this realm because prayer is an act. How we display faith, our reliance on God, our faith in God is through prayer. That's one of the key ways. It becomes an avenue for us to fetch eternal life and to live in this realm like that. If you're still with me, let me see a thumbs up or something. I haven't lost you. I want to make sure you get what I'm telling you today. If you're still with me, if you're still with me, let me see that so I can continue. All right. That's good. Why is this eternal life so important? Why is it important to us? We see from scriptures what eternal life truly is about. That life is to know God. It is to know God's Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind. But is that all there is to it? Could God be saying something else? Is this knowledge so important to me that I will leave everything to follow Jesus? I hope you know that we know how to have boys' night. Oh. I used to do it a lot. If I'm going to leave all of that thing that I know about my reality that was my previous reality to follow Jesus is there more is there more for me what can this knowledge of God and of his son achieve for me see we Christians need to be tired of just religiosity we go to church to mark a calendar Even our Christianity is not practical. And it's because most of us have not touched that realm of have left everything. We are still clinging on to something. That's the problem. If you've truly left everything, you would ask God some questions. Peter said, we have left all, all to follow you. My friends, there are two hidden mysteries linked to this knowledge. And both of these mysteries are pathways in the spirit. A mystery is simply an unsolved matter. That's all it is. That there is a matter that's not solved. We call it a mystery. And what makes it mysterious is that the points or the paths rather, the paths are disjointed. So you need to join them together to decode the mystery. It's like a treasure hunt, a treasure map. 
You know, I used to love watching movies like um, National Treasure, where you have people looking at a, a map, and they'll use that map to find a lost treasure. That's what a mystery is. So you have this mystery in different parts of scriptures and you must be diligent enough to put it together or to find those that have put it together and listen to them that's how this works so let's look at second peter 1 verse 2. let's begin to put it together don't forget he defined eternal life and he says that eternal life is tied to the knowledge of the father and the knowledge of the Son. Now give me Second Peter 1 verse 2. Give me that scripture quickly. Yeah. On verse 2. Verse 2 to 4. Can you change it to verse 2 please? We have to ask some pertinent questions. And when you begin to take your Christianity serious, you will find yourself asking these questions. If you will live a lifestyle, if you will live a particular thing that matters to you, to follow God, eternal life is promised to you. And that eternal life has some merits that you should know about. It's not just what you enjoy when you die. You can enjoy eternal life on the earth. Ionos, life of the age to come. You can borrow it and leave it here. So that when somebody like us says that we live in a realm where peace exists 24 7, we are not making it up. You've not followed cunningly devised fables. Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let me stop there for now. It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of Jesus our Lord. Aha! Eternal life brings you into the economy of knowledge. Okay? What well, Peter is now saying to us that the economy of knowledge brings you to know the Father, and to know his son, Christ Jesus. Don't forget what we talked about as far as eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and your son whom you have sent. So we are saying that grace multiplies based on that knowledge. Peace multiplies based on that knowledge. And that knowledge is still tied to eternal life. Through that increased knowledge, grace can begin to multiply in your life. So for instance now, a person carries the grace for favor. That grace is not going to be the same level all the time. It's going to increase. But how does it increase? The more you baptize yourself into eternal life, it will begin to increase on you. It will begin to increase on you. I don't want to share some stories. We don't have much time. There are things that you can touch because grace is multiplying in your life. And any kind of grace you are carrying, I render to you today that that grace can be multiplied in your life. If you peer that grace with the knowledge of God, if you pair that grace with the knowledge of Christ Jesus, it will begin to multiply in your life. Okay, let me find an example. My wife and I got married 10 years ago. We celebrated 10 years of marriage in June. I told her one day, I said, it's as though you've become more beautiful to me. 
if a person is in the first level of beauty, if you have the knowledge of God, if you have the knowledge of Jesus, as that knowledge is increasing, you are dipping your feet in eternal life. You are bringing the wisdom of the age to come into this realm. That grace, no matter what it is in your life, will begin to multiply. It's a major thing that people don't know. Any grace, any grace will multiply. Whatever God has graced you in, it will begin to increase. It will begin to multiply. And then I asked God, how do we know that this grace is multiplying? He said, that's why it was paired with peace. If you want to know that your grace is multiplying, you will be receiving increased peace in your life. You will be at peace. It will keep on increasing. Because as that knowledge is increasing, you are getting more baptized in eternal life. It's tied to the knowledge of God. So through that increased knowledge, peace will begin to multiply. And the scriptures cannot be broken. So if it is true that you have left all to follow him, as you begin to increase in the knowledge of Christ, as you begin to increase in the knowledge of the Father because of eternal life, the grace for divine health should multiply in your life. The grace for speed should multiply in your life. The grace for abundance should multiply in your life. It should increase. Every grace we have talked about this year, it should be multiplied in your life. That's why we emphasize spiritual knowledge on this platform. That's why we dig into spiritual knowledge. We want graces to multiply because grace has to be paired with truth to bring about a corresponding glory. Don't think it's just grace, fam. No. There are dimensions to it. Grace becomes the lubricant running a well-oiled machine called your life on this earth. That's the secret. So the first thing we are seeing, or the, one of, out of the two hidden mysteries, is that grace and peace multiplies to you in the knowledge. So it multiplies to you if you are in eternal life. As long as you are tasting of eternal life, the grace on your life should increase. If you are a teacher, for instance, like me, and you taught last year, this year, the grace should have increased. If it is true you have touched eternal life, it will increase. Every grace begins to increase. Let's see what else is attached to this knowledge obtained by eternal life. Now, let's look at verse 3 to 4. It says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Are you seeing that this knowledge thing is very important? It is linked to eternal life. Oh God, are you guys still there? Please give me that scripture, Victoria. If you're on the console, go back to that scripture, Matthew 19. Don't forget Matthew 19. Peter said, we have left all and followed you. What shall we have? And then he gives us the answer in verse 29. Everybody who has left house brother, sister, father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and they will inherit eternal life. Now go to John, the next one. John 17 verse 3. Quickly, quickly, quickly. I don't want you to lose sight of where we are going. John 17 verse 3, wherever is on the console. Admin team, can you please move fast? John 17, verse 3. Go back. Oh, my. 
Madam, John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life. This is eternal life. This is what Jesus said you will inherit. That you will know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So knowledge is the substance of eternal life. Knowledge. I would have taken you back to Genesis when, when God said, the tree of the knowledge of all of those things. I don't have the time to show you that. The substance of eternal life is tied to knowledge. Based on your knowledge, you can live the life of the age to come in this realm. Now go back to 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4, where we were. He's now explaining again as far as this knowledge goes. So the first thing we see is that grace multiplies, peace multiplies to you. Then he says in verse 3, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, still through the knowledge of him, of God who has called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Oh, okay. Let's move fast. Look at what that eternal life produces. Fix your eyes on that. It is through, still through knowledge that you can access a dimension of his divine power. This dimension is now to be a battle axe as a tool of deliverance. Okay? But let's put that aside. The main focus of this dimension of power supplies everything we need for life and godliness. It supplies all we need for life. It supplies all we need for godliness. And you can access the stream that supplies provisions for daily living through this knowledge linked to eternal life. That's the key. So your provisions for everyday living, it is still through this knowledge. And that knowledge is linked to eternal life. See, if I were you, I would spend my days trying to know more about God, trying to know more about His Son. That's the key secret. That's the mystery. That when you put it together, you begin to take out things that you can live in this realm with. The life of the age to come, you would have been entitled to it. You can access the stream that grants access to depths and dimensions in godliness. All because you are spending from eternal life. What else can we obtain according to Peter? Look at what he says here in verse 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. So we have exceedingly great promises. Then we have exceedingly precious promises. And he's saying that through these promises, we can become partakers of God's divine nature. God's divine nature. So as we begin to partake in this divine nature, it becomes a way of escape from corruption. The one that has crept into this world. That corruption came by lust. So if you're thinking about how to live a pure life, to stay away from the sins of this world, pornography, all of those things, it is there is a resource in eternal life that makes for that possibility. Guys, if you take nothing else from this teaching, I want you to know that eternal life is tied to knowledge. Can I see you guys write that? Eternal life is tied to the knowledge of God the Father and the knowledge of His Son. That's how we live this life. That's the provision God made for us to survive in this life. That's the 
that's the provision when the bible says that he gave us the power to become sons of god have you ever wondered why he had to give us power to become son becoming a son is work and it's also a walk it is work but it's also a walk of holiness you need power to do it power to not fornicate i double dare you to not look at a woman lustfully without power i triple double dare you there is a resource in eternal life that god has given us and if you stay to that eternal life if you stick to that pathway you'll be able to live life flawlessly in this realm that's the secret And I'm saying that that eternal life is tied to knowledge. It is tied to knowledge. Knowledge of God and of his son. If you, if you have this knowledge I'm telling you about, you will find that certain sins are under you. They're just under you. Now, this is the problem. For many of us, we don't have the discipline. So instead of escaping the corruption in the world, we fellowship with it. Not knowing that corruption competes with your ability to partake in God's divine nature. We mingle with corruption. We give room to corruption. See, you must fight corruption you must fight it. Anything that competes with your purity, you must fight it. So the boys are having nights out. They just say, come join us now. Just come and chill. You, you, you just stay there. You're not drinking away. You just chill there with them. That's how you get into corruption. With fellowship with it. And you cannot partake in the divine nature. One leg in, one leg out. You have to leave everything. You have to leave all to follow Jesus. Then the benefits of eternal life begin to, you begin to see it. See, when you don't partake in the divine nature, there is an instant block. You won't be able to access the things that make for your advantage, such as God's great and God's precious promises. And if you can't access the things that pertain to life and godliness, what then are you doing? So that's why many of us struggle. We are graceful, we are not graceful supernatural works. God has made it available. He's done his own part. What he's saying to you now is that I've completed the job. I sent my son. My son died for your sin accept his sacrifice and now for you to partake in eternal life all you have to do is to give everything leave everything and follow jesus and many of us are still one leg in the world one leg in the church we're not hot we're not cold we're trying to enjoy both worlds and it doesn't work that way if that is your testimony you will not be able to touch the grace that makes for supernatural works you can't because those graces are trapped in eternal life it is when a man leaves everything to follow jesus oh, and he begins to pursue the knowledge of god and of his son then a door is opened in the spirit for that person you'll not be able to live the life of the age to come in this realm please what i'm saying today is extremely important it is the difference in living a struggle life and a stressless life. I'm telling you the truth from the depth of my heart. For as long as you continue to do one leg in the church, one leg in the world, you cannot access eternal life. You have to leave everything and follow him. You have to. That's why... Many of us have the same prayer point over and over again. 
You've not left all to follow him. You've not. Eternal life is tied to the knowledge of the Father and the knowledge of the Son. God, Jesus Christ on the earth, promised it for those that leave everything and follow him. And I'm showing you the benefits here. The graces on your life will begin to multiply. And I'm telling I'm listen, oh my God. Listen to me, my friends. I'm not, there's no way for me to tell you that I'm opening my heart to you. I cannot do it anymore than I'm doing it now. Every grace in your life can be multiplied. Every grace. I thought I knew what sweet marriage was. The grace for marriage. God began to introduce me to a new dimension of it. Because it is all encompassing. Every grace can increase. It can multiply in your life. Every grace. And the proof that you've touched eternal life is that graces in your life begin to multiply and how we know that the grace is multiplying you can it can be indexed by the peace you are enjoying as well if there is no peace in your life something is wrong somewhere peter said we have left all to follow you we have left all have you left all to follow jesus Many of us are still dealing with these stresses in society, stress life. Let me continue. In eternal life, there are too many things that you are missing out. There are too many things. So grace multiplies. Peace multiplies. Then his divine power gives you all things that pertain to life your bills, your house, your car. His divine power makes for that provision within the context of the knowledge. And that knowledge is of God and of Jesus that can replace all of that for eternal life. So this statement in verse 2 reads, grace and peace be multiplied to you inside eternal life. That's what he defined it as. And when you are in that life, then you have access to the divine power that makes all things that pertain to life and godliness navigate in your direction. It's still, it's still through knowledge. And he's saying that that knowledge of him was because he called us by glory. He called us by virtue. Let me tell you what that means. He called us by glory means that he's, he has an end point in mind when he called us. He wants to bring you back to the point of glory, the glory that you lost. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when God calls you into eternal life and you accepted that sacrifice, you began to navigate towards glory, the lost glory you had with him. The lost glory. You do yourself a huge disservice by being one leg in and one leg out. You would never get the resource of eternal life. We have left all to follow you. So you still cling on to that girlfriend that knows how to chat and gossip. Once in a while, you still take that alcohol to buzz you up on Friday evenings. See, I'm telling you that a system has been established to provide for you everything that pertains to life and pertains to godliness. Why don't you try it out? What has this life produced for you anyways? In the last 30 years that you've been drinking, what has it produced for you? What do you have to lose? Try it out. Every grace will multiply. Every grace. Even the ones that are physical can multiply. I'm telling you the truth. So how do we balance our lives so that we can get rid of sin? Give me Romans 6, 4 to 14. Give me Romans 6, 14. The Bible says in verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under law, you are under grace. It's still knowledge. Sin can't have dominion over you. 
You are not under law. You are under grace. Will God tell us what we can't do? Now, if you have Genesis 4, 7, open it for me quickly. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. You should rule over it. You should rule. Now go back to that second Peter scripture. The biggest thing why believers and marketplace ministers can't enjoy the resource of eternal life is not because they don't have the knowledge of God. If for instance, you come to AIC, we feed you with knowledge. Everybody here, myself, Amy, Minister Yemi, the prophetic team, we feed you with knowledge. The biggest contention is that we've not left everything, one. And number two, we still enjoy sin. We enjoy some things in sin, some parts of sin that makes us feel good, makes us feel special. We entertain it. What I'm saying today is the summary of most believers' life. See, look at what he says in verse 4. By which have been given to us great and precious promises that through these promises you may be partakers of God's divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You have to escape that corruption. That corruption is in the world through lust. So people that still see that people are doing cool things the, was, the in thing now is for, to have a, 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 a sugar daddy Sugar that are you serious compared to what eternal life can give you? Sugar mommy, are you serious? Having escaped the corruption, God's divine nature is promised to you in eternal life. But you are the person that will first of all start and you will put your leg out of the world and you put both of your feet in eternal life. You must embrace it, you must leave everything. It's that fear to leave everything that is haunting us, most of us. And if you do that, you cannot begin to enjoy the resources trapped in eternal life. You can't. Now, Jesus was full of grace. Give me John 3.34. John 3.34. Don't forget where it started out from. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I said the context of glory is grace plus truth. You want to experience tangible glory in your life? God has made grace available in eternal life. The corresponding truth you are missing or missing out is you need to take your leg out of the world, put your leg in God, and then begin to chase the knowledge of the Father and the knowledge of his son. If you do this, these two things, you would have access to the resources of eternal life. Now look at Jesus. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the spirit by measure to him. He says God does not give the spirit by measure. Jesus Christ is the only human being that walked the face of the earth that had the Holy Spirit without measure. Everybody else carries a measure, no matter how anointed you are. In Jesus Christ, there are rare graces. There are graces that nobody has seen. Some of them, he himself walked upon it on the face of the earth. He walked in those graces. What stops you from accessing them is the fault in our character. Our characters are not built enough that we esteem God above all else. We don't want to leave everything to follow him. And there are some rare graces that you can see in the Bible. For instance, Jesus fed 5,000 men. I believe it was 5,000 men with five loaves and two fishes. 
I don't think we have seen anybody in the world that has replicated that grace. Not miracles, not healing. Now we've seen those ones. This is a rare grace. I hope you know that anybody that can multiply fish and bread can multiply money. I hope you know. Because whatever multiplies bread and multiplies fish won't discriminate. It's to multiply anything. It's a rare grace. So when the Bible says that he was given the spirit without measure, that is what enabled him to display some dimensions of grace. So imagine you had that kind of grace. Can God trust you to not become a danger to yourself and to your world? Anything you touch multiplies. See, you must know that God has no problem giving these graces. He wants to display his body, the body of Christ. He's preoccupied, like I said, with his kingdom coming in the hearts and lives of men. That is the preoccupation of God. He wants his kingdom to come. So he has no problems giving out these graces to those who have left all to follow him, follow his son. But the issue is our character. God keeps having to compete with mammon in our lives. And he doesn't like that. The Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. And you keep hearing it in this kingdom that the pathway to life is death. Pathway to life is death. You hear it from Apostle Arame. You hear it from Apostle Selma. And from every great preacher, the pathway to life is death. Let me rephrase that thing for you so that you understand. The pathway to life eternal is death. That's the way to put it for you. If you want to taste eternal life, you will die to what you know called your, your world. You want to access the treasures of eternal life. Treasures that are in the age to come. Oh, you will have to become a spiritual man. You can't do it without dying to the flesh. You can't do it. And many of us, we, we are like, we are like, um, what's that animal that tries to hold everything and won't let go? We are trying to enjoy eternal life but we are trying to enjoy the world. We don't know what it means to leave everything to follow God. Let me continue. How do we get the graces needed for work? Even the rare graces that Jesus walked in, how do we get them? How do we get higher measures of grace? I've shown it to you in eternal life, knowledge. Give me John 1 verse 16. That begins to round up. John 1 verse 16. If you are here on this call, I'm speaking to you. You specifically. You who have been contemplating leaving the world to give your attention fully to God. Anywhere, my friend, the world has nothing to offer you. The world leads to corruption, eternal damnation. You cannot dip your leg in God and dip your leg in the world. You are playing yourself. And for as long as you do that, you will go on this trajectory whereby nothing fruitful comes out of your work with God. It's not God's fault. God's side of it is done. It's your side that remains. God sent his son to die for you and I and grant you access to eternal life. And this eternal life is the first thing that we do to get it by our decision to follow Jesus. We confess our sin, we abandon them and we take him into our hearts, accept him. 
But the issue is that we keep on going back out into the world. And if you keep on doing that, what has your name on it to be looking at you? And you'll keep on praying 24 7 and they will not be able to navigate in your direction because there's a law in place that law is the law of eternal life you have to increase in the knowledge of god you have to increase in the knowledge of his son however you must have left the world we have left all to follow you that's how we get the graces to combine with our work that leads to a corresponding glory they are all trapped in eternal life. It is true that instrumentality that grace multiplies. And how we know grace is multiplying is that our peace keeps multiplying with it. So don't worry, your grace is intact. You can go home and rest. You can go home and rest. As long as you're experiencing peace, you can know that your grace has increased in all ramifications. It is tied to knowledge. Eternal life itself is knowledge. How much of God do you know? Look at what it says here. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. Of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. Give me John 3.34. Uh-oh. John 3.34. The Bible says, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives not the spirit by measure unto him. And I want you to understand that that measure is determined by you. The measure you walk in. In this day and time, nobody's saying leave your wife leave your business leave your father leave your mother that's not what's required of you but what's required of you is to leave everything that you know as your regular life that you know that displeases god and then begin to pursue the knowledge of god and of his son if you do what i'm telling you you will now begin to enjoy the resource called eternal life the life of the age to come in this realm. Now, let me end by saying this. Jesus said in John 20, 21, As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. How his Father sent him was that he gave him the spirit by measure, without measure. For you, for you, you determine the measure. The spirit has been given to you, but you determine the measure. And you determine it by your lifestyle. So all we need to do is to continually get ourselves filled With eternal life. And when we do that, then we begin to experience what the Apostle Peter says grace multiplying, peace multiplying. And if you know how to pray, you know how to get filled. So you don't waste your time when you pray. Before you know it, it begins to saturate your heart. And then there's an overflow of the glory on your inside. Because there is glory on your inside as well. The formula for glory remains grace plus truth. Now, let me summarize so we can end. This year, we've talked about a few different kinds of graces. The grace for favor. The grace for access. The grace for divine health. The grace for abundance. The grace for speed, the grace for forgiveness, the grace for kingdom service, the grace for kingdom influence. But there are also some very rare graces that are possible in Christ. They are kept in the resource of eternal life. And if you understand what I'm telling you today, you will now see why some men become living wonders. 
Me, I ask God questions. I don't know about you. I ask God questions. See, let me tell you the truth. The more a man dips his feet into eternal life and begins to enjoy that, the more that person becomes a living wonder on the face of the earth. Look at someone like Bishop Oedepo being a trailblazer, built huge mega churches in Africa, in Nigeria, for instance. That is a grace. That is a grace. That grace is trapped in eternal life. It's in eternal life. It exists. People like Apostle Larum are just raising giants in the body of Christ. It's a grace. The grace was given for a particular work he has to do for the kingdom. It exists in eternal life. It exists. Being a revivalist. When a man carries the grace for a generation like Apostle Zellman. See, those graces are not things that you you will say they are not possible in our day and time. I'm telling you the truth. You know, we used to think that these men of God were just called and just giving. They were giving, you know, blessings. Bam. Take, go and walk with these blessings you have. No. They dipped their feet in eternal life. That's it. That's the truth. They took their legs out of the wall. They began to chase God. They began to pursue knowledge. I just talked about eternal life, but there were two things he promised people. He said that person will receive a hundredfold in this life. So you don't lose at all. But God is after your character being formed for the Christ. That's what gives him glory. So besides the graces I was talking about for work, then there are rare graces. Your part is to identify the work God has called you to do in the body of Christ. Then you can go after those graces because they are in eternal life. They're all there. In the Bible, we see a story of a man called Balaam. He says, wherever you bless is blessed. Wherever you curse is cursed. That's a real grace men carry, believe you me. They are graces. They are graces. In 1 Corinthians 7, 7, Apostle Paul talks about the grace to live a life of purity. Purity. That's a grace on its own. If you look at Elisha's story and Elijah's story, Elijah did eight miracles. Elisha did 16 miracles. A double portion indeed. They are graces. Do you know what God has called you to work? What, what, what you need to do? Do you know what your life has been aimed at for? My friends, don't deceive yourself being in the world. Though. There is nothing the world has to offer. There's nothing. Focus on God. Dip your feet in eternal life. The knowledge of God and of His Son, Christ Jesus. That's where it is. That's where it is. And sometimes there are rare graces developed in the body of Christ. You can pioneer your own dimension. You can combine the unique graces God has given men. It will create your own custom anointing. You, it will make you a wonder in the face of that. Sometimes service. Through service, you can develop graces. You can, you can inherit graces as well in eternal life. Honor. So into a person's life. All of these things are, are truth. So let me stop where I started out from. John chapter number one. The Bible says we beheld his glory. That glory was full of grace and truth. And I said, any grace combined with truth will result in a corresponding glory. Anytime, anywhere in the world. 
Any grace combined with truth will result in a corresponding glory. When we are told that God called us by glory and virtue, he's trying to reinstate you back into that place of glory. I rest my case here. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you touch your people where they are, every grace, that their life is shut up as they make their decision to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, as they begin to decide to follow you, to take their leg out of the world, would you have mercy? Have mercy. Give us the grace to stay pure and clean for you, to leave all to follow Jesus. Give us the grace to leave all to follow Jesus to leave all, all that we know as what looks like gain in the world. Your servant, Apostle Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Make that our testimony, that as we are living and breathing, it is Christ we live for. You have so much for us, prepared for us in eternal life. So much resources trapped in eternal life for us so that we can live the life of the age to come in this realm. Would you have mercy? We are laboring under a closed heaven, some of us, because we have ignored the instructions for eternal life. We don't want to leave all to follow you. Have mercy. There is a glory that you've called us to. Bring us to that level of glory, Father so that we can make you proud and show forth and showcase your kingdom on the face of the earth. Thank you for everybody listening. Give them the experience, the taste, a glimpse of that glory that you've called them to, so that they can go after the requisite graces and match it with the corresponding truths, the work that you want them to do in this life. Even the grace of a father can be increased. The grace of a mother. The grace to teach. The grace to, to walk. The grace to sing. The grace to dance. Every grace that you've given us is a gift from above. Give us the, the heart that sin will not have dominion over us. Thank you, Father, for answered prayers. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Edith is saying some Christians don't have access to what pertains to life and godliness while unbelievers do. Don't know eternal life. What could be the reason? I don't get that question at all. How can unbelievers have access to eternal life? They don't have access. They don't have access. Guys, thanks for hanging out with us. We will all We'll talk to you guys. Tomorrow is our 10 hour prayer marathon. Come on the altar and come pray your heart out. God bless you guys. Have a nice day. Bye. We hope you have been tremendously blessed by this message. You can help us spread the message of Marketplace Ministry by sending the link to this message and sharing it with just one friend or family member. As a tribe of Marketplace Ministers, our goal is is to focus on building kingdom entrepreneurs with kingdom truths that can transform their lives and destinies. Finally, we don't collect offerings at Entrepreneurs in Christ. But if you would like to sow a seed into this project, you can do so via World Remit or PayPal, or you can request our account details in specific countries. Thank you again, and God bless your every move. Remember to like, Subscribe and share this video with a friend. God bless you.